So we're going to talk about uh, drugs that affect the autonomic nervous system today. Uh, we're going to go over um, some adrenergic agonists, um, a few antagonists, alpha blockers. Um, beta blockers have actually been taken out of this section and put in your cardiovascular section. Um, they may have been put in here because some sometimes beta blockers are used for uh, things such as tremor or other um, disorders, but they've been put in with cardiovascular um, medications because their primary use is hypertension, um, post MI, and and other cardiovascular uh, disorders, cholinergics and anticholinergics, and we're also going to talk about anticonvulsants in this section. So your autonomic nervous system, some things to remember, your cholinergic um, system, if you have something that has cholinergic effects, you're going to have constricted pupils, increased saliva, bronchoconstriction, increased GI mucus, and bladder fundus contraction. Um, so a good thing to remember is things that are drugs that are anticholinergic can have certain effects um, that that are obviously the opposite of this. I um, mean, we'll come we'll come back to that later. But the common thing we hear is dry eyes, dry mouth, urinary retention, and constipation. And a way you can remember that is we we have the saying that you can't see, you can't pee, you can't spit, and you can't. Well, you know the last one. Um, adrenergic, you have dry mouth, dilated pupils, increased car contractility. Uh, increased heart rate, bronchodilation, and your bladder fundus relaxes and your sphincter contracts. So you have cholinergic drugs, which are uh, parasympathomimetic, um, cholinergic blocking drugs, such as like anti-muscarinic or anticholinergic, adrenergic and adrenergic blocking drugs. So these are two of the sympathetic or adrenergic nervous system um, receptors. So alpha adrenergic causes vasoconstriction, pupil dilation, and relaxation of the gut. Beta adrenergic causes cardiac acceleration and increased contractility, which makes sense when we think about what our beta blockers do. Vaso, excuse me, vasodilation of um, arterioles supplying skeletal muscles bronchial relaxation and uterine relaxation. The bronchial relaxation makes sense because we use beta agonist to treat um, asthma and COPD. Primary use of these receptors, alpha-1 blockers are used in nasal congestion, hypotension, um, or dilating the pupils for eye exam. Alpha-2 blockers are used for, or alpha-2 receptors are, are blocked for uh, hypertension. Beta-1 for uh, cardiac arrest, heart, heart failure, or shock, and beta-2 are targeted for asthma uh, and other respiratory disorders and premature labor. Just a few examples of cholinergic medications. Um, so these are cholinergic agonists. Um, you're not going to see a lot of them, but you're going to see um, of the direct-acting ones, the bethanacol or pilocarpine, but where you're going to see the most is cholinesterase inhibitors. Uh, for um, dementia or Alzheimer's. So they're treated, used to treat glaucoma, uh, GI tract or at urinary bladder um, disorders, and myasthenia gravis. Anticholinergic drugs, these are commonly used for various disorders. Um, some you're going to see, such as like trihexafenadil, are used for movement disorders. Oxybutynin and other um, anticholinergics for overactive bladder disorder uh, are used for that in urinary incontinence. Scopolamine for motion sickness and then benzotropine or cogentin for movement disorders also. And when we're talking about those, we're talking about you know, extra pyramidal side effects, um, tardive dyskinesia, um, dystonia, akathisia, things like that, those movement disorders. So anticholinergic meds for incontinence. They're most effective when combined with non-pharmacologic treatments or behavioral interventions such as scheduled um, bladder uh, emptying, you know, going to the bathroom at a scheduled time of day, and uh, restricting water at certain times of day, things like that. Um, they're only useful for urge incontinence or overactive bladder. 
And you want to be careful when using the elderly because they can cause cognitive impairment. That last bottom bullet that's starred, I want you to remember this, they're all equally effective. The differences in the medications are their cost, their adverse event rates, and their route of administration. All of your anticholinergic meds for incontinence or overactive bladder are all equally effective. So you're going to want you're going to have to base your your decision on the cost, whether it's brand name or generic or covered by insurance, adverse event rates, or if somebody wants one that's not a PO medication. Here's the comparison of side effects that you can see that. Um, you know, so some of them are worse for dry mouth, some are worse for constipation. Um, that oxy at the top is oxybutynin. Um, that's just been uh, been shortened to fit in the chart. You can see that the oxybutynin regular oral, it has the highest rate of all of them because it's an immediate release. A lot of patients uh, have, have a uh, resolution of those adverse effects when they go to an oxybutynin ER tablet which is still fairly inexpensive um, and covered by insurance as you go down the list you get less and less coverage by insurance um, you know so you may you may want to try the oxybutynin then oxybutynin ER then go down to one of those below if a patient can't, can't tolerate the first two cholinesterase inhibitors are used for myasthenia gravis and Alzheimer's disease um, you can see that the most common ones are, are denepazil. Um, then we can have rivastigmine and, rivastigmine and galantamine. Uh, mamantine, mamantine is actually not a cholinesterase inhibitor, but is used for Alzheimer's disease. And it's just put in here for uh, brief mentioning. Um, those, again, they're, they're all equally effective. Uh, you have to base it based on... Um, adverse drug reactions, and then which ones go through the kidney and which ones go through the liver if you have a patient with liver or kidney um, impairment. You can see here from the frequency of adverse effects, something that I like to point out is for the most part, you know, rivastigmine, the second column, that's your PO, rivastigmine, has the worst side effects of all of them. That's why they formulated the rivastigmine patch. Uh, which is which goes by the name brand of Exelon for patients to you to apply um, apply it it avoids that GI upset that a lot of patients have um, but it's still the the percentage of those adverse effects is not still not as low as denepazil PO um, so unless the patient has some kind of um, reason why they can't take denepazil, you know, liver dysfunction or drug interactions, you probably want to go with denepazil as your first choice. Uh, it's, it's, very, it's just as effective, less side effects, uh, covered by most insurance plans, and, and comes in a generic uh, version. You can see here the pharmacokinetics. The one thing I really want to point out is that denepazil has liver elimination. So if your patient has liver dysfunction, you can't use it. Rivastigmine is purely kidney elimination. So same thing with liver or uh, kidney dysfunction with rivastigmine. If your patient has both, then you can um, one or the other, and you can't use one. Then galantamine would be your option because it's going it goes through partially through the kidneys and partially through the liver. Cholinergic blockers, um, atropine is the prototype, which is going to dilate the eyes. A um, couple options in that category. Scopolamine is used for motion sickness. It comes in a patch that the patient puts behind the ear and then uh, swaps sides of the ear every three days. Ipratropium is a bronchodilator, which is um, used for asthma and COPD. Benstropine is used for extrapyramidal side effects. And, um, and then the oxybutynin, of course, um, is mentioned down there. So quickly moving on to anorexients. So these are um, appetite suppressants that are used for weight loss. There's a few options. All of them are controlled substances except Orlistat, which is over the counter. Um, but it's hard to tolerate because if the patient eats um, fatty foods, then it will cause, um, it could actually cause uh, anal leakage 
causes upset stomachs and upset stomach and it's actually recommended that patients carry an extra pair of underwear with them at all times. So I haven't known a whole lot of people who were able to use it uh, effectively. So you want to make sure they're used short term. Uh, they're very similar. The prescription ones are very similar to amphetamines. So they're essentially, think of them like a, like a legalized speed. Um, they, they work through norepinephrine and dopamine release and decrease the appetite. They're, they'll give patients more energy, um, and they, they work well, but you want it to be short-term, and you want the patients to realize that this is not going to cause you to lose weight if you continue to eat like you, you did. It's supposed to help decrease the appetite and get you, and you add it on to exercise and diet um, to help you those first 8 to 12 weeks. Here's just a... Um, a comparison again. This is these are additional drugs that have the indications or are used for weight loss. These are the non-controlled options. So we have the Orlistat at the top. We have uh, Lorcaserin, which is a fairly new medication that works through serotonin agonism, um, and it, the response has been at about a five percent weight loss. Uh, Phenamine to pyramate. That's a combination that is controlled. Um, and you have to have a REMS program due to potential teratogenicity. So basically, um, it can cause problems to patients who are pregnant. So similar to Accutane, you have to sign up for a REMS program in order to be able to prescribe it. The patient has to be in the program, and so does the pharmacy they're using. Now, Trexone and Bupropion are used as a combination. Uh, bupropion is an antidepressant that we know causes appetite suppression. The naltrexone is supposed to work also as an opioid receptor antagonist. So the combination um, is supposed to give at least a 5% weight loss. And then liraglutide is a GLP-1 agonist, uh, most commonly used for diabetes. Uh, that is approved for weight loss, at least a 4% weight loss. Um, you can see that none of these drugs has a, has a large percentage weight loss uh, from their trials. It's not like these patients are losing 15, 20% of their, their, um, their body weight, but it can, it can help along with other lifestyle modifications. You'll probably see more GLP-1 agonist approved for weight loss. I know that, uh, I think Bietta is, uh, is getting that approval and, and I think some others are, are going after it, um, trying to help, uh, trying to get more indications to go along with their, their treatment of diabetes. Anticonvulsants, um, that we're, we're kind of going to brush over this category, even though there are a lot of options. You, you definitely want to read more into the slides that, that are on here and in your book to know the differences in them. For the most part, you know, don't touch a patient's anticonvulsants unless you, you know, let their neurologist do it. What you're going to focus on are the drug interactions and the side effects that could be caused by these. So if your patient comes in complaining about something, uh, you may know that it's the drug causing it, not the you know not a, a you know a new disorder that they may have. As far as anticonvulsants go, they're all um, nowadays anticonvulsants can only hit the market as adjunctive uh, treatment for certain for seizures because it's unethical to do placebo trials in patients. So they have to compare themselves to, uh, to existing drugs and show that they're not inferior to those drugs. Then as more and more studies, studies come out, they can compare themselves to older information and get monotherapy indications. That doesn't mean it can't be used by itself. I just want you to realize that if a patient has, is only on a medication that is approved for adjunctive therapy, it's okay. As far as seizures go, for the most part, you put them on whatever controls their controls their seizures at the lowest effective dose. If it's one, if it's two, if it's three, that's the combination they have to have. Beyond ethosuximide, which we're going to talk about, uh, I think, in a couple slides, um, they don't really have a specific type of seizure that they treat. Ethosuximide is only approved for absent seizures. Um, so that's the that's really the only one that has a specific indication. So quickly, the um, hydantoins, that's uh, phenytoin and phosphenytoin. 
basically, Finney Towing um, can be given IM or, or IV or PO. Phosphine Towing can also be given IM or IV. The benefit for Phosphine Towing is that it can be given faster. Finney Towing, um, Finney Towing can only be given at a certain rate. And so it may it may need to be given faster, and then phosphonitoin can be given in, in an emergent situation. Phosphonitoin is also dosed in phenytoin equivalents. Um, so the phosphonitoin you'll, you'll dose it in phenytoin equivalents. The phosphonitoin will go in the body. It will be um, broken down a little bit into phenytoin, and it will provide its effect. But you can you can administer it faster. You can see there's a lot of drug interactions that go on with, with phenytoin. Um, in general, your older antipsychotics cause a lot more drug interactions than your newer ones. Um, we are going to, these are all good slides. We're going to jump back, I believe, to, yep, here we go, to the ones that I put in there. Um, these are additional to what your book has. So you want to carefully monitor the following in renal disease, gabapentin, Pregabalin, topiramate, zanisamide, levetiracetam, and felbamate. In hepatic disease, you want to watch carbamazepine, phenytoin, valproate, lamotrigine, tiagabine, and felbamate. The ones to avoid in pregnancy are depicote or valproic acid, phenytoin, and felbamate. And the ones that are questionable in pregnancy, this would really be a risk versus benefit, is carbamazepine. Now, the ones that are and the ones that are okay in pregnancy are gabapentin and lamotrigine. Now you you probably know that the FDA has gotten rid gotten away with the or gotten away done away with the uh, pregnancy category A, B, C, and D and X listings. They're now going to um, statements that that explain what the um, the birth defect might be. So like with with lamotrigine, it can cause a cleft palate. But the cleft palate, I think, forms and that would form like within the first. I think it's like not by by week nine, um, and it's and it's very very low risk. I mean, it's it's like three patients in a. I don't want to exaggerate, but it's something like three cases in a in a million or something causes that. But it's higher than than if you didn't take lamotrigine. So they they have to list it on there. But if your patient doesn't know they're pregnant until week twelve, they're on lamictal. It doesn't matter if they have that, if they get, if they they're taking it or not. Once the palate is formed, it can't go back and, and create a cleft palate. Um, so it's important from now on to going forward to read those pregnancy categories, especially with these, because certain drugs may have, um, especially in a, a, anti-epileptics, may have teratogenicity teratogis, only in certain trimesters. So if a patient has gotten past that, um, then then it would be an okay option to, to choose or um, something you wouldn't worry about if a patient shows up with these drugs and is and is now say twenty weeks pregnant. So this is a good brief overview of each medication. I'm not going to go through each one of these uh, bullets, but I'm just going to point out the the high points. So. Um, Carbamazepine has a lot of CNS side effects. It does auto-induce its own metabolism. So about four to six weeks after you start it, you're going to see a drop in serum level. Target serum level is usually um, 8 to 12 for, for seizure disorder. Um, and you're going to monitor it based on, based on guidelines. But don't be surprised when you see that drop. And you're going to need birth control backup for women who are taking Tegretol due to the, inc the induction of metabolism. Again, ethosuximide has GI side effects and is only uh, approved for absent seizures. Felbamate, not used a whole lot because of the aplastic anemia and hepatitis um, and, it, and its drug interactions, but you may see it sometimes for Lennox Gestalt seizures. Very, very, very infrequently. Gabapentin is not used a lot um, anymore for, uh, for an anti epileptic drug just because there's better options out there. Um, but it may be useful in geriatrics, and it may be useful for patients with com uh, comorbid psychiatric disorders, such as anxiety. We see a lot, a lot of that. Lamotrigine, um, mostly the same side effects as carbamazepine. It's used frequently in kids because it may um, just give them a little bit more energy. 
uh, very few drug interactions, basically birth control um, and, uh, and Depakote. But it's actually pretty well tolerated compared to all our, our other anti-epileptic drugs. Levoteracetam has no interactions and is available PO and, and IV. Usually really well tolerated, except it can have some CNS side effects like agitation and irritability. So you really want to avoid this in patients who already have a psychiatric disorder, um, comor a comorbid psychiatric disorder. Oxcarbazepine is related to carbamazepine, so you want to watch out if a patient's had an allergic reaction. There's no autoinduction. It has more hyponatremia than carbamazepine, but other than that, it's, it's more tolerable. And there's a 30% cross-reactivity with rash uh, if, if there was a rash induced by carbamazepine. Phenobarbital is one of our older drugs. Um, significant CNS side effects. Um, can decrease IQ in kids if it's used long term. It's available in multiple forms um, and it's, it has a lot of drug interactions. Phenytoin is the same way. Um, it's, it's effective. It has uh, different kinetics, so you're going to want to look up a zero order kinetics when you, when you dose phenytoin and get accustomed to that if you're um, having a patient you're having to dose. Um, and you may need birth control backup because there's a lot of drug interactions. Pregabalin um, is sometimes used for seizures nowadays, but usually it's, nowadays it's used for neuropathic pain, fibromyalgia, and anxiety disorders. It is controlled, um, as is phenobarbital in the previous slide, so it may, may make it a little bit harder to get a hold of, but we don't commonly see this used for seizures anymore. Um, but it's an option if you have a treatment refractory patient. Tagapine, it, tagapine is very, um, very rarely used, only in refractory complex partial seizures. Topiramate has a unique side effect. It has concentration and memory problems. So a lot of times patients will get used to this, but when they start it, they, they like to call this drug, uh, instead of Topamax, they call it Dopamax because they just feel like they're thinking in a fog um, all day. And they may, they may actually say a few things where they... Um, that they wouldn't usually. They're just kind of maybe loopy or that they just can't think straight. But usually they get they get through that. Um, Topamax can cause anorexia or weight loss, um, which may not be a bad thing for certain patients. Um, it may cause metabolic acidosis. Again, that's really rare. That's because it, it's also a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. But that's really rare and it can cause kidney stones. So you want to watch out for patients who already have problems with kidney stones. Um, that's who you really, who, where the contraindication would be. It's a very popular anticonvulsant anti because it's good for generalized generalized epilepsy and migraine prophylaxis. And a lot of these um, are, are effective for migraines, but uh, to Topamax seems to be more tolerable than, say, like Depakote. That, that's approved for migraines also. Speaking of Depakote, um, Depakote is... Uh, is a good anticonvulsant. It's an older one, so it's got drug interactions. It's got a lot of side effects. It can cause tremors, um, a, lo a lot of nausea and weight gain, and, and or can a lot of nausea and vomiting. So if they have that, you want to switch to the extended release version. Um, if they have uh, weight gain, is just a part of it. Um, you know, they want to focus on diet and exercise. Uh, make that a, make that a priority, and then if you have to switch it, you can. Pancreatitis, I mentioned this one because pancreatitis can happen at any point in the therapy of Depakote. Um, doesn't matter how long they've been on it, if it's a dose change, what their dose is, what their serum level is. So if they have sharp stabbing pains, not a stomach cramp, but sharp stabbing pains, um, usually accompanied with nausea and vomiting, they need to go to the hospital. Uh, I've actually had a patient who, who died from this and it, it took about six hours from when he had the pain to, to when, he, when, he, when he died. So um, it can happen very quickly. So we want them to know that this, this can happen. Um, Depakote, like I mentioned earlier, does have a, ser a goal serum level. Um, you'll see a, a, the maximum listed as 100 or 125, depending on which reference you give. You see, um, you know, usually patients, you know, you may shoot for the higher end of that, 75 to 100. But if the patient is controlled at 50, you don't need to keep going up. Their serum level is 50, that's, that's fine. Um, you're more so, you want to draw it to make sure they're compliant. 
make sure it might be adequate, and then you also don't want to take them up too high and risk these other, these other side effects. Zonisamide, um, not used as much as, um, it's very similar to, to, to Topamax, but not used nearly as much. Can cause kidney stones, mild cognitive side effects, cross reactivity with a sulfa allergy, um, and usually used as just ad adjunctive therapy. So that's a really quick, brief um, lecture on those. By no means is that enough to cover um, anticonvulsants. But if you have any questions, let me know. There's a lot of great resources on, on Canvas on differences in the medications, the uh, metabolism, which ones require serum levels, all that kind of stuff. Um, so make, go through those. Uh, be aware of them. You may even want to take, I think I have a few cheat sheets in there of side effects to watch for. Um, and again, you know, don't, don't try to, take, uh, to you know, tweak somebody's anticonvulsant medications. Um, leave that to their, their neurologist. You just want to watch for if they're having problems with it um, or for potential drug interactions. Again, if you have any other questions, just uh, just let me know.